Hi, Dr. Reagan Robertson, CCO of Productive Dentist Academy here, and I have a question for you. Are you finding it hard to get your team aligned to your vision, but you know you deserve growth just like everybody else? That's why we've created the PDA Productivity Workshop. For nearly 20 years, PDA workshops have helped dentists just like you align their teams, get control of scheduling, and create productive practices that they love walking into every day. Just imagine how you will feel when you know your schedule is productive, your systems are humming, and your team is aligned to your vision. It's simple, but it's not necessarily easy. We can help. Visit ProductiveDentist.com slash workshop. That's ProductiveDentist.com slash workshop to secure your seats now. The biggest take home point that I do have for being an associate is if you do not feel comfortable in an office situation, you don't have to stay in that situation. You are in a professional career. You're in a setting where you, you dictate treatment, you dictate how you want to treat patients. And if you feel like somebody's pushing you to do things that you don't feel comfortable doing, do not stay in that position yeah. because it's a good fit for you at the end of the day. Welcome to the Everyday Practices Podcast. I'm Reagan Robertson, and my co-host, Dr. Chad Johnson, and I are on a mission to share the stories of everyday dentists who generate extraordinary results using practical, proven methods you can take right into your own dental practice. If you're ready to elevate patient care and produce results that are anything but ordinary, buckle up and listen in. Hey, everybody, this is Chad Johnson on Everyday Practices Podcast, the Everyday Practices Dental Podcast. And we're here today with uh, Charles Major, who's uh, near Nashville. Uh, Dr. Major, where do you practice? Is it Hendersonville or? Murphy's, Murfreesboro. Murphy's, I mean, Murphy's, Murphy's, yeah, that's right. That's right. So we're, um, today, we're Reagan now. is on assignment in a special fancy place. So I'll let her share that news later. But uh, it's just going to be. Uh, uh, me and Charles today, so just so you know. So, um, Charles, tell me, uh, how many years have you been in practice? I've been in practice for eight, coming up on eight years in May of this year. Okay. And where did you do school? I did at the Medical College of Georgia, which is now, I believe, Augusta University because it's changed yeah. names about eight times. Yeah. Okay. Like. okay. Um, did you go straight from undergrad to dental school? No, I did not. Tell I actually. I took a year off in between um, of dental school or undergrad and dental school. The reason why I did that, it was to piss off my mom, number one. Uh, (laughs) Hold on. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I just didn't see that within the first 30 seconds. (laughs) You're going to be like, wait, what? All right, keep going. No, so um, I actually took a year off because I, um, I, I played college football when I was um, an outside linebacker. So I actually was, I went to the Citadel, the Military College of South Carolina, um, Division One AA school, and I played football there for all four years that I was there. Um, initially, I did want to be um, an orthopedic surgeon. That was my initial career path that I chose, but then I went and shadowed a dentist who actually was a classmate of my mother's in college. And after I shadowed him the very first time, he threw me in there. He said, get some gloves on. Um, you, If you want to do this, you need to do this. And wow. so the first, the very first patient he was working on when I walked into his office, I put on gloves, didn't even have on the right size because they were all, uh, yep. it was all, yeah, uh, wrinkled up. And I had no idea what I was doing. There was spit everywhere. The patient was choking. And, um, but after that, I picked it up and I love dentistry ever since then, especially to see the cool things that he was doing. Um, and then also he was an African-American dentist as well too. And the fact that there was only three African-American dentists in Charleston, South Carolina, and to see his role, uh, or to see how he was a leader in the community and everybody around him looked up to him. Um, that kind of, that was another thing that I said, wow, I really could see myself being in that position as well too. But, um, coming back to your question, um, I did take a year. I took a year off because in between dental school and, or in between undergrad and dental school, the city was very rigorous um, on top of the academic, um, on top of the military stuff that we had to do. And then also being a um, student athlete, I was, I felt like I was to the max and I didn't really real college experience because I was 
we were locked up. Um, we only got to get off campus on Wednesdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. That was it. Um, so I felt like I wanted to enjoy, like enjoy my yeah. uh, years per se. And so to do that, I was going to, I worked in the dental office, the same one with Dr. Freeman at the time. And, um, and I did my little fun college thing, you want to call it in between. So that was the reason why I did take a year off. But then also I did want to have a little bit of a one up in dental school as well, too, with the hand skills, the lab skill, everything that comes along with that. And he kind of said that he's, he said, if you do what I tell you to do, you're going to be very well set um, once you yeah. start school, essentially. Yep. And he was right, 100%. Yeah. So you get done with dental school and uh, do you, like, how did your practice start? Did you start your own de novo? Did you buy someone's? Did you associate first? How's that looking? So when I graduated dental school, I went, I moved to Atlanta. So I was in Augusta, Georgia at the time for dental school. And then after Augusta, I moved to Atlanta. After I moved to Atlanta, I did associate I, the very first office that I associated in. I was there for right around six months time frame. Um, and then after I left there, I went to another practice and I was there for a little over a year. Um, I think about around a year and a half. Um, so that put me close to two years. And then um, right around that, the time I left the second practice was when I, I met my wife. Um, she actually lived here in Tennessee and met her. And I was actually looking for an excuse to get out of Atlanta. And she gave me the, after met her, fell in love, knew she was the one, said, look, I'm out of Atlanta. I'm done with this place. Yep. And moved to good old Murfreesboro, Tennessee, which is um, 10 times smaller than Atlanta, Georgia. But um, good place to grow a family. Um, great. It's just a completely different mindset from here to Atlanta. I don't know if you've ever been to Atlanta before. Um, I've been to at, both. Okay. You've been to Murfreesboro? Yeah, passing through because like when we go from, from Iowa down to uh to Nashville or Chattanooga or Atlanta or uh or let's say Orlando, uh you're driving through there. Right. Okay. 24. Okay. Yep. yep, yep. That's exactly out there. Um, but and then after I moved here, I worked with the DSO and I worked with the DSO for about four years. Um I was there with them for right up uh, a little under four years um, when I opened my practice. And then I stayed on with them for about eight months after I did open up my office. And I ended up doing a startup, start start. Okay, so that's cool. So back up, associate, what was one take-home point for listeners that are in dental school or an early associate? Uh, I know it's putting me on the spot, but like if you had, I'm not asking for three or 10, What's one, and it doesn't even have to be the best one, but what comes to mind as your, you know, take home point for being an associate? The biggest take home point that I do have for being an associate is if you do not feel comfortable in an office situation, you don't have to stay in that situation. You are in a professional career. You're in a setting where you you dictate treatment, you dictate how you want to treat patients. And if you feel like somebody's pushing you to do things that you don't feel comfortable doing, do not stay in that position yeah. because it's a good fit for you at the end of the day. I like that. Um, okay, so fast forward to the DSO. That was kind of cool because that helped you transition while you were getting your practice started. Uh, but what was your take home point from DSO land? Because you've done it all. Uh, yes, I, right? I mean, real, well, just think about it. You've done associateship, you've done associateship through DSO, you've done um, ownership. So, like, really, uh, aside from retiring and, and selling, you know, you've you've in eight years gone through a good gamut that some people need to learn from. So tell me, DSO, what was your take home point? Um, my take home from the DSO was um, learning as much as I could because I knew I was moving towards practice ownership while I was with them. So when I was with the DSO that I was with, they weren't they weren't very pushy on the treatment aspect of it. Um, so that was a, that's why I, that's why I stayed with them as long as I did. Yeah. Um, they also had a very, very huge training component or seed component as well. So I learned how to do sedation. I learned how to do Invisalign. I learned implants. I learned a ton of stuff with them. Wow. And with all of those big, bigger procedures and making or helping me feel comfortable doing those procedures, that's what the biggest take home. I, I utilized every bit of the CE education that was offered by them to help me to further advance my career, essentially. There. Yep. 
Yep. Cool. Um, so eventually you start owning your own and then you work your way out of the DSO contract. So uh, looking into trying to maximize, you know, your, your legacy and your, you know, for your kids and stuff like that. Uh, how did you end up running into PDA workshop? Uh, like, you know, so just for the listeners, that's how uh, Charles and I met about uh, two months ago. And so how, uh, you know, like, how did you come about finding the workshop? Was that Megan's find? Was that your find? A friend told you? What's up? So I, when I was practicing at the DSL that I was at prior to opening up my office, it was a 45 or an hour and a half commute daily. So on that commute there, well, 45 minutes there, 45 minutes back. On that commute, I would listen to podcasts religiously, podcasts and audiobooks. And that's how I built up my knowledge about business, um, opening up an office, just listening to podcasts like you, um, listening to Bruce Beard, and um, just a whole plethora of podcasts. And a lot of, since I was um, so well-versed in the different podcasts that I listened to, a lot of uh, really successful dentists mentioned Bruce Beard. And oh, said, yeah. They said, PDA, if you want to change your life, change the way you practice, you need to go to PDA. Yep. And when I was with the DSO, I was like, mm, I'm not going to spend that kind of money when I'm not even the owner of this practice. So it doesn't make sense. And they have their own way of running things. So that's how they do it. And that's obviously I'm an associate here. So I don't have that full autonomy with that. Um, but uh, so I've been I've been hearing about Bruce Beard for a long time. And then after finally getting an office up and running, seeing some of the inefficiencies we were having. And the biggest reason why we said, hey, we need to go to this um, seminar is because we were starting, we we're hitting our 12-month-ish um, time frame, And what we're realizing is at the 12-month mark, we were so fully loaded with hygiene recall, we didn't have any room for new patients at all on our schedule. And that was starting, we could start to see a decline in what our production and collections were um, previous to the, the previous year there, even right. though last the previous January was very slow because we only we didn't have as much going on, but I could see a decline from where we were at. We obviously we had an uphill traction going and then it started to dip a little bit. Um, and that was one of the main reasons is the fact that we just didn't have the influx of new patients. And that's when we said, OK, there's something we need to do. There's something that we're missing. And uh, and I said, this is a perfect opportunity for me to jump on what I've been hearing about for so long. And that's why we decided to make the trip. Cool. So you went and you were looking at, uh, you know, the workshop with, uh, you know, trying to figure out, okay, what inefficiencies can we help solve and how do we maximize our, our block scheduling and everything like that scheduling to production, which to me was a brand new concept. I mean, was for, because it's a, cha a little bit of a variation on block scheduling. I mean, did it, did you kind of walk in? I, I seriously, I think my hands were folded and I was like, what I mean, did that hit you the same way that you were kind of like, what do you mean scheduling the production? And then if you're blocking out six hours for these veneers, like what, why would you do that when you're just, when you only need an hour and a half or you, were, were you thinking along that line at first too? Did it kind of yeah, but you? Yeah, I would. Well, I would say I, I wasn't because I've already been listening to Bruce Beard. I've That's what I wondered. Yeah. If his podcast, so I, I, which are super short, but they're to the point about scheduling. Yeah. So you were pre prepped oh. for it. Right. So I was so I kind of knew what he was talking about because I heard him say it, but I didn't know exactly how to frame or how it would actually work in daily practice. But um, I will say I went in, me, my wife and I, we went in with a very open mind um, because we were willing to take in what we could and anything. Um, and like I, you obviously know this because I did mention it at the um, at the seminar. I do a ton of CE and um, a lot, mainly the CE is primarily clinical. But every clinical CE I go to, I always go in with an open mind because they're, these people who are teaching these courses, they're experts. They know what they're talking about. They know what they're doing. They've tested it. They tried it. They um yeah. They know all the ins and outs of it. So who am I to come in and say, oh, I know I know all of this stuff. I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about. Sure. When I really don't, I don't have any clue about business. Um, so that's, I did kind of, I went in, I was, I didn't really know, but I did know because I listened to it before, but I didn't know exactly how to go about it. That's the yes. better way to put it. Well, you know, I was awfully heavy the last 10, 15 years on clinical CE. But I think what really helped was the PDA workshops and learning under Dr. Bruce Baird was that it taught me how the soft skills to be able to sell it. So that way, you know, so that way patients say yes to the treatment 
So tell me, when you uh, shared uh, at the Saturday graduation, you were talking about risk factors and you wanted to implement that into your practice. So here's uh, accountability time uh, on the podcast in front of everyone. How's that discussion going with that, with your patients? How's the risk factors discussion going? It's going great, I will have to say, because now um, after hearing basically, and that's another component as well, too, is the um, having conversations with patients because uh, going to all these CE courses or clinical CE, I know a lot of different procedures, but I didn't really learn how to talk to patients about them. And uh, with the PDA and talking about risk factors and just having the kind of, or getting on, getting to know the patient as well, too, of course. Third in dental school, never treat a stranger, all this, that, and the third. But you never really knew what not treating a stranger meant. Um, I, right. Obviously, I, I'm, sure. yeah, correct. And I am, I will say, I am a personable person. So I will get to know a patient. But with what I learned at PDA, I don't feel, I was not getting to know patients on that kind of level. No. Like, and so as soon as I came in, we already, we changed our um, new patient intake sheets. I even, I even redid it. So we have these sheets here. Uh, right. So we, every single patient, we go through everything. Um, what's your occupation? When's the last time you saw a dentist? Um, what, it, what things do you like to do? So the, the staff is already uh, taking notes on the patient. So by the time I go into the room, I just have to look at the cheat sheet and just go ahead and open up the conversation again with them. And um, I think I can even see just from that, that's already been, um, it's helped out immensely with uh, just planning and case presentation and things like that. So what what are some of your favorite uh, one-liners that over the last couple months that you've started to use? Do you find that you're, yourself saying, you know, whether it's in the next four months, four years, we should, you know, do you find yourself saying one of those brucisms or... That and then um, also, we're not going to be able to fix you overnight. This didn't happen overnight. We're not going to fix you overnight. Um, that's a big one that I do use a lot as well, too. Um, and then um, there's how about, one. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. I mean, it's yes. amazing how you're just connected with people. Like, yeah, you know. Yeah, and then also um, the ballparking as well, too. I've been doing, I've started implementing that. Um, the, the biggest one that we do a lot of Invisalign and before I would just say they would ask always I talk to them about it in the first question how much sure. and before we'd be like yeah let me get so and so to come in and talk to you about that um, but now it's down to the point I'll just say 5,000 just throw it out there and right. just read, read their facial expression and see what they say and then off of that, then we have another conversation of does this fit into your life right now what can we do to help you to, for this to fit into your life, or um, if it doesn't fit, then when do you see it happening? Is it six months, 12 months down the road? So what I like about that is at first people are like, well, I don't want to be pushy. But the cool mm-hmm. thing is if you actually broach it and then you dial it back and say, but I mean, you know, you can do it or not do it. It's all the same to me, you know, right. it, and you leave it up to the patient to decide, but you gave them the opportunity to choose. Uh, it's mm-hmm. so liberating because people a lot more than I think we assume will choose to do the healthy option. Uh, right. But a majority of dentists will say, well, I don't want to you know, talk to them about this or that. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to is like, well, I mean, I don't want to tell them they have you know, $30,000 of damage. They'll get up and leave. It's just like, well, right. what if you actually just said that? What if you said, you know, this looks like it could be you know, a $30,000 bill. And, and I, I even just will say, frankly, that's, that's a lot of money. I, I mean, uh, you know, how do you feel about that? And it's amazing because sometimes people say, I was even thinking that I read online, it was 30 or 35. And it's just like, so they knew. And and so I wasn't the first one to broach it. And now I get to say, well, what do you think? I mean, do you want to make a, a move to get that healthier or is now a good time? Just like you said. And they might say, you know, I've got three kids in braces right now. And I'll just say, hey, totally get it. How about I make a note in the chart and we'll bring it up in a couple of years but, because I know it's important to you, but I also don't want to overly bother you with it. And uh, uh, one of the, the lines I'm trying to think uh, uh, what his name was, um, and uh, he'll, you know, but uh, when he's lectured at a PDA um, Blue Sky event before, uh, it's we'll wait with you, you know, and, and using that line, just it's OK, we'll wait with you. And the pressure's off now. It's like we've discussed it. 
uh, it might be a yes, it might be a no, it might be a maybe, but you know, just broaching the subject and at least feeling them out where they want to go with it, as opposed to not even bringing it up. Right. And it's yeah. funny that you said that because I even had one patient that I, I did throw out the number. I was like, it's right around 15,000. And he was like, the first response was like, he was like, that's kind of what I was thinking, what it yep. was going to be something around there. Mm-hmm. So he was already prepared and he knew. And as soon as I said that, he was like, okay, that's what I was thinking. Well, practicing that with patients, I mean, because, you know, if, if I do two $25,000 arches and, you know, so I'll say, listen, I mean, I get it. This is expensive, but dentistry is full of expensive and more expensive, but there's no cheap dentistry. So, I, I you know, when I'm looking at this case, you're, you want to do upper and lower, it's going to be 50,000 bucks. And, mm-hmm. and uh, just to at least, like you said, kind of read them in it. And the guy said, I, I figured it was 25,000 upper and 25,000 lower. So when can we get scheduled? And it's like, but it's cool because if you're resolute about saying that, as opposed to feeling bad about telling someone that it's, you know, a thousand or 1500 for a crown or something like that, that you can go in and say 50,000. I mean, you know, that's a huge number to throw out, but just to say it straight face and be a compassionate too, to say, I know that's a lot of money, but I mean, I'm trying to help you and I are in the same team. We're trying to solve this problem. And mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm kind of your Yoda that's trying to help you get to where uh, you want to be. And this is going to be what it's, it's going to cost. I mean, do you want to move forward or do you want to think about it? What, you know, what do you want to do? Um, I want to real quick to another um, Bruce says as well too, is the judgment free. Um, just let yes. the patients know. Cause they come in and they're already, like he said, they come in tensed up. They're looking around at everything. And then as soon as you tell them, they're like, I, I know I've just been dreading this appointment for a long time because I know I got a lot going on and this, that, and the third. And then I just sit there and talk to them. I'm like, look, I'm not going to judge anything that you did in the past. What we're going to do is we're going to focus on the future. You're here right now and you're here for a reason. The reason why you're here is because you want to get better. If you want to get better, I will help you get better. And, but at the ultimate thing, we're going to have to do this together. And as soon as we have that conversation and I let them know that I'm not judging them, just like Bruce said, you can just see everything, just the their shoulders get less tense. They just sit back in the chair a little bit more. There's And it just opens up everything. And then they start sharing a little bit more with you about why they don't like this and this, that, and the third. And then we can just kind of have a conversation though what they should be expecting with everything moving forward. So yes, that's a, that was another huge one that I took from that as well. Well, so um, what's your what's your 10 year plan? What what do you want to see in your practice? That's a that's a very loaded question. Um, my 10 year plan, I do I want to see I want to be at a point where I'm not doing fillings anymore. Um, yep. I don't want to be spending wasting my time doing fillings, I feel like. Um, I want to be doing very comprehensive cases. Um, I've been doing a ton of training and I feel like that's where my passion is, is doing pretty much like Bruce said, seeing train wrecks and fixing the train wrecks. Um, so that is my ultimate goal and passion um, in order for me to do that. Obviously, I'm going to need to have an associate in place for that. Um, and I also want to be at a point where I'm practicing more just because I want to have fun practicing, not because I need to I'm need to make money in order to pay bills. At the end of the day. I want to feel I don't want to feel financially bound to doing certain things. Do you think you'll get there in 10 years? Oh, yeah, that's my goal. Good. I, I respect guys like you, um, military personnel, uh, college athletes that have a different degree of tenacity to achieve a goal. You know, I, I love seeing that grit. And uh, I, I I knew, I, I don't know, it's kind of a, a softball question to, to th- lob at you. Like, do you think you'll get there? Because I suppose the realistic answer could be like, no, it's probably going to take me 12 or 15. But I just, I could tell before I even asked, I was like, I think I knew the answer. I just wanted the, the audience to hear it. So I'm proud of you. That's well, awesome. Hey, fill me in. Megan helps with your social media. So how is she attracting her ideal patients, especially now that she's gone to the workshop and gone through that marketing afternoon that we talked about that stuff. Well, she is, um, it's funny you asked that because now it's just, her focus right now has been a schedule. Um, she okay. did take a lot of social media aspect, but, um, and we've been kind of talking about different ideas and patient uh, 
meals and things like that we've been discussing. And that was another huge one was having raw um, testimony footage. So we don't bring out our phones or cameras out enough, I feel like, in the office because we've had several criers, break, patients breaking down. And we didn't, I was like, I was holding that man on film. Yes. And so now it's one of those things we need. We're trying to be focused on being ready for, and that's whenever I, uh, if I have a patient, I, I'll say, hey, uh, get your phone ready so we can go ahead and record this. Yeah, I like that. So let's say someone, I, I've got two questions. Let's say someone uh, is hoping to do a scratch start. Uh, what's what's your advice? My advice is location. Make sure you find the right location. That's huge. Um, that's what's been key to um, our uh, early on success. Um, reason why I say early on, because I don't feel like we're successful yet. Um, but that will put everything in <laughs> That'll put everything in the right place in order for you to be successful. Because if you if you don't have the right location, because I obviously I've listened to quite a few podcasts, and that's one of the biggest things that I've heard is they didn't have the right location, so um, they struggled initially. Um, and that I feel like that'll take a lot of weight off your shoulders about worrying about getting patients to come through the door. Um, and sorry, what was the other question? No, I didn't give you the second one yet, but the second one is kind of like it. So the first one, you know, was what would you, uh, what advice would you give for scratch start? And you said location. So now let's say that someone has done a scratch start. They've picked the perfect location, but they've still got some struggles. Um, what would you tell doctors wanting to uh, consider or, you know, like checking into the PDA workshop? Um, oh, yeah. So I would definitely tell them, obviously, check out the PDA workshop, you know, if ands or buts about it. Uh, there's, I feel like there's different um, sets of courses that you should take at different points of your careers when it comes to, um, when it comes to doing a startup or when it comes to um, certain areas of expertise that you're looking into doing. And uh, PDA, I feel like if you're going to open up an office, um, whether if it's an acquisition or a scratch start, you need to go to PDA um, because they will retrain your brain from what you thought before and make it make sense in order for you to be successful in your business. And then also, obviously, like um, individuals like you who are faculty there and seeing your success and just hearing your stories. And then even there were several other dentists there who were um, who it wasn't their first time there. There were quite a few dentists who were there that wasn't their first time and just hearing their stories and how they went in and applied everything and they listened. And when they listened, they applied it. It actually it made sense and it actually helped them boost, um, get to the levels that they wanted to be there essentially. Right. Uh, well, cool. Good. Thanks. Um, what's on the horizon for you? Like what's this next year look like, uh, as far as implementing, let's do clinical CE first. What are you looking at? Um, clinical CE, I am looking at, uh, I just took an occlusion course this weekend and that, okay. that just blew my mind with, um, a lot of um, treatment planning yep. um, because, like I said, I, well, I actually am a, um, I'm a spear guy, so I'm okay. getting the whole spear track right now. Sure. And, and obviously, to a lot of you guys at the PDA, I'm, I'm looking into COIS as well, too. Um, and then with the occlusion courses I took this weekend, I'm kind of considering either Panky or Dawson as well, too. Sure. So. Um, but yes, no, this year is going to be a lot of surgery. Um, I'm doing a big implant surgery um, continuum in Alabama. Um, so that's going to be my focus for this year and nice. uh, systems, um, business systems, obviously. And we also did um, do coaching as well, too. So we do have um, the PDA coaches. We're starting that process as well. So cool. when do you get started with that? Uh, we actually had a meeting with Callie and Christine today. Um, oh, so nice. we are, well, we had our onboarding uh, two two weeks ago, and then uh, today we actually did the full out um, breakdown of what we're looking at, the goals that we're trying to set. And it's funny that you said, um, "Do I see myself being there in ten years?" And the, that was a conversation we had with Christine today because Christine said, "This is I want you at." I want you to shoot for this goal because this is what goal is going to um, collection goal is going to help it make sense for you in order for you to pay your bills and then also for you to make the money that you need to be making. That's right. And um, when she said that, she was like, so how do you do you guys want to slowly step up? And I said, no, we're not stepping up. We're going to start that from day one. That's what well, we're see, that's the beauty. Every office like there are some people that are more successful with going at their own pace and and slow is, I mean, I've just seen it work actually, um, th that I have some PDA friends that 
have done slow and steady and it works for them really well as opposed to necessarily you know like just going out the start gate too fast but then there's other people that are like no i'm all in and the cool thing is there's not a right or wrong it's what do you as the leader want to do and then they'll help you achieve it so that's awesome because like basically you're kind of giving them the green light to be like all right let's do it and that's what they said we're gonna hold you accountable every step of the way so (laughs) i bet please do because here i am i'm seven years into coaching and i'm still uh you know trying to calibrate and and rewire and, and get myself to be better and better and 10 years from now, I'll be better, but I still will have improvement to make. I never would have thought that I'd be uh, still at, you know, at a point where, but coachability is a mindset, right? You talked about that early, in, earlier indirectly that you have to be willing to be like, I haven't arrived. I've arrived to a spot and that's good. I'm, I'm better than I used to be, but I've got more uh, growth and, and development to do so. Yeah, good for you. Well, hey, listen, I appreciate you coming on for the last, I don't know, half hour-ish and, uh, you know, talking this stuff through. This was really good content. I really appreciate that. And uh, hopefully the listeners um, will um, not only uh, get a a kick out of some of this, some good nuggets, but maybe even a year from now, we revisit with you and Callie, let's say, and say, all right, so it's been a year, you know, how's stuff going? What are you implementing And, and stuff like that? But I'm I'm really proud of you and Megan, and uh, it's it was uh, good sitting at lunch with you on that first day, and uh, you know, uh, kind of checking in, and and that's kind of why 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 I wanted to get you on the podcast was to uh, kind of give your story. So yeah. Well, thank that. you so much for joining us today. Much appreciated, man. No, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Coming up next week on Everyday Practices Dental Podcast. A cyber attack on your business can feel as sudden as a heart attack and cost you your livelihood. If the recent attack on Aspen Dental didn't catch your attention, the fact that roughly 90% of security breaches happen because of human error will. There are three things hackers don't want you to know when it comes to your security. And the reality is you may be unintentionally committing one of the three biggest security mistakes in dentistry and not even know it. I'm Reagan Robertson, co-host of the award-winning Everyday Practices Dental Podcast. Dr. Chad Johnson and I are here with an exclusive, limited podcast series to help you protect your team, your practice, and your business. We invited one of the world's leading cybersecurity defense experts, Adrian Santangelo, and PDA's Information Security Officer, Robert Niles, to dive into the underworld of cybercriminal activity so you can understand the different types of attacks that happen today and the new threats on the horizon with the development of AI technology. Adrian is the Chief Digital Forensics Officer of SciEmptive, the only cybersecurity company that guarantees threat elimination. He is an award-winning ethical hacker and IT industry expert that actively identifies, detects, and blocks ransomware before it hits the news. With over 30 years of experience in computer security and digital forensics, he lives and breathes giving others the knowledge, resources, and support necessary for business owners to safeguard their livelihoods. We will also feature Robert Niles, who brings 28 years of Linux Unix systems administration experience, four years of HIPAA compliance, and three years as a certified information system security professional. He is on a never ending quest to protect others from the quote unquote baddies, and he is passionate about all things compliance, protection, and client education. Get ready and buckle up for this exclusive limited podcast series by Everyday Practices Dental Podcast. This could save you thousands of dollars, hours and days of manpower, and maybe even your livelihood. Thank you for listening to another episode of Everyday Practices Podcast. Chad and I are here every week thanks to our community of listeners just like you, and we'd love your help. It would mean the world if you can help spread the word by sharing this episode with a fellow dentist and leave us a review on iTunes or Spotify. Do you have an extraordinary story you'd like to share? or feedback on how we can make this podcast even more awesome, drop us an email at podcast at productivedentist.com. And don't forget to check out our other podcasts from Productive Dentist Academy at productivedentist.com slash podcasts. See you next week.